Is Dungeons & Dragons demonic? This is your guide to D&D for Christians and homeschoolers, from a Christian homeschooler. I wasn't allowed to play D&D when I was a kid. When I got older, I decided to find out if it really was all that bad. So my wife and I joined a local D&D group to learn more about it. This is what I've learned since then. Dungeons & Dragons is just one of many tabletop role-playing games, or TTRPGs. Think of it like playing pretend with your friends. Remember when you were a kid and you said, I am the mightiest warrior, I will defeat you, villain, and then you dueled your brother with a plastic sword? This is basically that, except you're sitting at a table rolling dice to determine what happens. It's make-believe, math, and a board game all rolled into one. But that's not all. Everyone at the table is telling a story together through the game. Groups usually meet on a regular basis to keep these stories going for months or even years. Now, I know what you're thinking. D&D isn't just a game. What about all those stories I've heard? Isn't D&D demonic? Aren't the kinds of people playing this game into the occult? What if players pretend to be evil? Boo. Don't worry, that's why I made this video. Let's address these concerns one at a time. First, here's a good rule of thumb. If you're okay with Lord of the Rings, you shouldn't have any problem with D&D. They are very similar in their aesthetics and setting. Like Lord of the Rings, D&D has magic as well as good and evil fantasy elements. There are noble wizards, scary ghosts, and cursed orcs alike. That being said, every group is different. Players usually sit down before starting a game to talk about what themes they're comfortable with. If you want, you can avoid vampires and demons and just stick to fighting plain old bad guys. And remember, it's all make-believe. Nobody is actually trying to cast spells or speak to the dead. So, yes, D&D has magic, as well as good and evil fantasy tropes, but it doesn't necessarily have to. That's the great thing about this game. The adventure you have is up to you. As a Christian, I don't use any made-up religions or gods in my D&D games. I prefer to play without them. But D&D was designed for a fantasy world where many gods exist and behave similar to the pantheons in Norse, Roman, or Greek history. They are spiritual beings who fight with each other, bestow power upon mortals, and cause general chaos. They are not there to tempt you into denouncing your faith. They simply serve a narrative purpose, providing outside forces to explain the presence of magic, influence the world, or offer a challenge for the players. But remember, you can run the game however you want. You could have only good gods, only one god, or don't talk about gods at all. It's entirely up to you. Now, one core part of the game is your character's class. This determines whether you're a wizard like Gandalf or a ranger like Aragorn. There are a couple classes themed around using magic given to you by a divine being, but this is really just for flavor. You can come up with your own reason for having magic. Likewise, there are some spells designed so that your character asks a god for guidance or wisdom, but you could just flavor it so that you have a keen sense of your surroundings or something. It's not a big deal. Again, you can play the game however you want. Pretending to slay foul beasts and find buried treasure is all well and good, but what if you wanted to do something bad? What if you wanted to kill innocent civilians, partake in evil rituals, or just be a creep? Well, you'll be glad to know that for most D&D groups this isn't a problem. You see, D&D is a cooperative game. You have to work together with your friends. It's difficult to function as a team when you have evil characters there. It just doesn't work. This is why most groups don't allow evil characters at all. If someone at the table is sabotaging your team's plans or going against their morals, that's the fault of the player, not the game. Ow! Whoops. My best tip to avoid inappropriate role-playing is to just be mature about things and communicate, just like you would for any other conflict. If you can't come to an agreement, you'll be better off finding a different group to play with. It's that simple. D&D can cost as little or as much as you want. The basic rules are available online for free. You can get a set of dice for a few bucks. The rest of the game is pen and paper. You don't need miniatures, maps, or a dungeon master screen, but they are pretty affordable if you want them. A great way to get into D&D is to buy a starter kit for around 20 bucks. The official books with more character options, more monsters, and more adventures usually cost 20 to $40 each. It's a very affordable hobby if you have any amount of self-control. Like any other hobby, role-playing games are a fun pastime that can be turned into an unhealthy obsession. But there's nothing unique about D&D in this regard. It doesn't have expensive cards to collect, like Magic the Gathering, 
It doesn't use instant gratification to get you addicted like some video games do. It isn't physically unhealthy like energy drinks or sugar. It's just a game. And if you treat it like one, you have nothing to be concerned about. The media did a lot of fear-mongering about D&D in the 80s that, simply put, wasn't substantiated. If you've heard stories about kids who play D&D and were suddenly stolen away by demon worshippers, it's probably nonsense. Liar! Liar! Get back, witch! Let's take a look at an example. Ever heard of James Dallas Egbert? He was a brilliant student at Michigan State University in 1979 who played D&D. As the story goes, he got lost in the steam tunnels underneath the campus while playing a real-life version of the game with his friends. A detective found a bulletin board in his room with thumbtacks in it. He said it looked like a map of the tunnels. That's how the media presented it. Game might have turned into death trap. Did Dungeons and Dragons swallow Dallas Egbert? So what actually happened? Well, Egbert did enter the tunnels, but he left them shortly afterwards and he wasn't playing a real-life version of D&D. The tax in the bulletin board were not a map. In fact, D&D had nothing to do with his disappearance at all. The detective who made those claims later admitted to not knowing anything about the game. It was all speculation. As it turns out, Egbert was just dealing with a stressful household, depression, and eventually substance abuse. Sadly, he lost his battle with depression a while after this ordeal with the steam tunnels. That's just one of many stories the media manipulated so they could blame Dungeons & Dragons. But trust me when I say this hobby is not a cover-up for cultic indoctrination, pagan rituals, or evil death traps. It's just a role-playing game that nerds and theater kids play for fun. Anything you hear otherwise is likely exaggerated by the media or just pure fiction. Now that I've addressed some concerns, let me give you an idea of what playing D&D is like. One player is called the Dungeon Master, or DM for short. His job is to set the stage for the game by explaining where the party is, determining what happens when they do things, and standing in for all of the different characters they meet. Everyone else plays as one of the heroes. Together, they're the adventuring party the story revolves around. The Fellowship of the Ring, if you will. We begin where we left off last time. You walk into the Gilded Hopper Tavern and you see a bunch of different shady looking characters in here. Uh, the bartender has a sullen expression on his face and he washes a mug as you walk in the door. What do you do? I walk up to the bartender. What can I get you? I'm looking for an orc in a yellow hat. He might have a young man named George with him. We think he's been kidnapped. Make a persuasion check. Uh, that's 10 plus 3, so 13. I don't meddle in personal business. Sorry. I want to look around the room and see if I can find him. Okay, roll for perception. Uh, 18 plus 3, that's 21. You look around the room and you finally see a few different characters in the corner that you didn't notice before. One of them is a soldier, and the other one's a peasant, but the third one, you lock eyes with a dark figure with a little bit of yellow sticking out at the top, and suddenly you see him. He steps out from the shadows and says, Seems you lot have finally forced my hand. Roll for initiative. Uh, 10 plus 5, 15. That's 13 plus 3, so 16. All right. Charity, you're up first. What do you do? I cast Fireball. I give up. And that's basically D&D. It's a lot of fun. It's not about devil worship or corrupting the youth. It's about nerding out over cool looking dice and miniatures, developing creative backstories for characters, and channeling your inner actor through a hilariously bad accent. It's about solving mysteries and defeating nefarious villains, just like you pretended to do when you were a kid. And most of all, it's about telling a story with your friends and improvising your way through a crazy fantasy world that's part Lord of the Rings, part Breakfast Club, and part Princess Bride. So give it a try. You don't have to sacrifice your soul to play a game with your friends. 